Hello, everyone, and welcome to LabX's Before You Buy webinar series. My name is Mary Beth Didana, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, Strategies for High Quality Recombinant Protein Production. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to submit your questions to us at any point during this webinar. Our speaker will address these questions during the question and answer session following his presentation. To ask a question or make a comment, simply type your query into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many questions as possible during our time together, but if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to our speaker and he can respond to you directly if possible. Additional resources for today's presentation are located on the right-hand side of your screen. I'd like to remind you that this webinar recording will be available on demand shortly following this presentation, so please watch your email for information from LabX on how to access this free video. I would especially like to thank Sino Biological for sponsoring this event. Their support allows LabX to keep these webinars free of charge for our readers. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Yunning Chen received his PhD in protein biochemistry from Ohio University in 2012 and completed his postdoctoral studies in protein biochemistry and biophysics from Pennsylvania State University in 2016. Dr. Chen is highly skilled in recombinant protein expression using multiple host systems, protein purification, and biochemical characterization. He currently holds the position of Senior R&D Manager at Sinobiological and is responsible for the design of novel recombinant protein products and platform optimization. Dr. Chen, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuning Chen. I'm currently a Senior R&D Manager at Sinobiological. And I would like to take this opportunity uh, to talk about strategies that we use to obtain high quality recombinant proteins. So this talk will be divided into these four parts. So first of all, I would like to give a quick overview of Sinobiological, and then we will enter the realm and to talk about recombinant protein expression and the strategies uh, to make high quality recombinant proteins. And lastly, I will summarize the uh, content of the talk. So first, let's learn a little about uh, Sinobiological. So uh, we are a biotech company uh, whose headquarters is located in Beijing. And uh, uh, we have also established uh, subsidiaries in several places in mainland China, as well as uh, somewhere in Japan, in Europe, as well as in the uh, United States in order to uh, handle our uh, growing international businesses. So our company was founded on the basis of recombinant protein expression, recombinant antibody expression technologies. And after about 15 years of development, we now have over 700 employees and a large uh, lab and office spaces uh, in Beijing, as well as in Taizhou and Suzhou uh, in, Ch uh, in China. Um, our lab facilities are certified by both international and domestic uh, agencies, and our core businesses in, uh, involve uh, the development of biologic reagents such as recombinant proteins, antibodies, uh, cDNA clones, ELISA kits, and so on. And uh, we also use our uh, recombinant expression platform as well as antibody development platform uh, to support various customer service projects. So Sino um, is um, dedicated in order to become a one-stop reagent provider for all fields in life science. And after, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, after 15 years, uh, we've been around for a little uh, for a while now. Uh, we have established a uh, uh, extensive uh, library of category products, including genes, proteins, antibodies, and ELISA kits. Our products have been used for clients both in industry as well as research institutes. And these products, the, the quality of the products has been uh, validated. Uh, I think we can, based on the citations um, that accumulated over the years using our products. And our products has been used uh, by users in more than 90 countries, uh, so which makes the Sino, Sino brand a global, uh, a global brand with uh, very good recognition. 
And also because we have a very well-established uh, recombinant expression platform, uh, we use such platforms also for uh, uh, con uh, contract research uh, service projects. Uh, so for recombinant protein expression, we have these uh, four well-established uh, expression platforms. And we also, uh, in the meantime, we will also have uh, established different antibody development formats to create antibodies using technologies such as hybridoma, phage display, B cell sorting, and so on. And so because today our main topic is going to be recombinant protein expression, so um, it will be uh, highly, uh, highly associated uh, with our recombinant protein production service. Now let's start the main topics of the day uh, to talk about recombinant proteins and the strategies that we use uh, for, for their uh, expression, purification, and so on. Because uh, we perform a lot of uh, product development as well as contract research services, uh, sometimes um, we encounter uh, problems uh, with all shapes and formats. So and the uh, during the years, we have also accumulated uh, extensive knowledge for um, troubleshooting. So I would like to take this opportunity to share with you uh, some of our, our experience as well. So proteins or, and the recombinant proteins, um, what they are and why are they important? I think we are or uh, we and all other life forms are coded by uh, what, by some format of codes, and I think we can all follow this fall into this central dogma of molecular biology, which is the DNA um, that in, that we are encoded by DNA, which is transcribed uh, transcribed to RNA, which is then subsequently translated into proteins. And the proteins are the frontier players that actually carries out various uh, biological functions. And the uh, proteins are comprised of amino acids. Now, I think in that with, there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids with different side chain structure and functionalities. And uh, these amino acids, um, they, um, when, when they're uh, arranged in a certain way, they form the primary structure of the protein. And, the, um, and based because of the characteristics of the side chain, um, these, the, the the peptide chain will uh, will rearrange and fold into more complicated structures such as uh, helices, beta sheets, coils, and these secondary structure will further uh, fold either via uh, covalent or non-covalent interactions between different components in uh, of the protein to form these more complicated tertiary or quaternary structures. So proteins are the, uh, the fundamental building blocks of life. Uh, they carry out various uh, biological functions. Um, they can be structural components of the cell or the extracellular matrix. They directly involve in our immunity. Um, they perform various catalytic activities in uh, biological functions. It dictates the, uh, the, uh, the signaling uh, inside and outside the cells. And they perform, uh, they, they participate in central nerve, nerve system activities, and so on and so on. And because they're the, uh, the direct executor of various biological functions, it is very important to understand uh, the function and structure to relationships of different proteins. Um, so that's, <clears throat> I think that's also the, uh, that's also the key importance why we would need to uh, gain a deeper understanding in terms of protein chemistry and the protein biophysics. So in order to study proteins, um, I think one uh, very one key factor is to obtain enough protein for us to perform uh, various assays. Cork, uh, if we use naturally occurring proteins, there are different issues associated uh, with this resource. So first of all, it's limited. The, the yield is very low, and it can some uh, and the, it can be, uh, vary a lot between you know different batches. So in order to um, solve this problem, or in order to uh, to 
generate a, a essentially a unlimited supply of uh, of proteins then enters the uh, concept of recombinant DNA technology followed by the concept of recombinant protein expression. So basically what happens is we ident identify a gene of interest, we insert it into an expression vector, and then we transfect this expression vector into the host cell and harness the uh, host cell protein manufacturing machinery to massively produce the protein of interest. And, the, uh, and after culturing, the protein of interest are extracted from uh, cell culture or, li uh, or cell culture lysates uh, by different uh, purification methods in order to obtain high quality purified proteins. Uh, so um, proteins made this way are, are called recombinant proteins. Um, we, they can, we can essentially have a limited supply of these reagents. And <clears throat> because they're made in a cell culture environment, Based on the material we use, we can make protein into an animal-free format, which will facilitate their downstream applications. And the and also the whole the, the massive production of protein of interest by host cells will result a, a much higher yield than extract proteins from natural sources. And because uh, the with the development of fermentation technology. Uh, the batch-to-batch -batch variation from recombinant proteins can be easily controlled. So with that, we can have a, a different uh, recombinant proteins of different shapes and formats, and they can be used uh, for various applications, such as therapeutics, uh, for structure biology study, as industrial catalysts, uh, supplements for cell culture, matrices for biomaterial development, and drug targets for drug development and as core material for diagnostic kits or assembly and so on. Now, the key elements involved in recombinant protein expression uh, involve, involves vectors, host cells, as well as purification strategies. So vectors, uh, so they're the shadow that, uh, that carries the protein of interest and insert it into the host cells. So vectors are normally are usually uh, presented in the format of plasmids. So these are circular double-stranded DNA and often presented in a uh, supercoiled structure. Uh, some structural features on plasmids, including the promoters, multiple cloning sites, and uh, antibiotic-resistant genes are important either to help uh, initiate transcription or to help harbor the protein of interest. So once the uh, plasmids has been constructed and once the uh, target gene has been inserted, uh, these plasmids are usually are then subsequently trans uh, transferred into uh, a into a host cell to for protein for protein expression. So here I listed a few commonly used host cells, uh, which include. Uh, mammalian cells such as HEC293 and CHO, insect cells, yeast cells, and these are all eukaryotes expressions, cell expression systems, as well as E. coli, which is a prokaryote. So each uh, different uh, host cells, based on their different genetic backgrounds, um, they have uh, certain characteristics in terms of the recombinant proteins made uh, from derived from uh, each host. So for mammalian cells and insect cells, they, they can ensure the correct folding of the, the correct folding of the target proteins, and they can impose some uh, post-translational modifications onto these proteins. And for uh, for mammalian cell cultures, uh, because um, they're derived from uh, from a mammal source, so their uh, post-translational modifications are are more. Uh, close to their natural counterparts, at least for some human proteins, and the, and this host cell, uh, this host system is suitable for expression of soluble protein or secreted proteins. And for insect cells, because they can reach high cell culture density, um, they are excellent. They are excellent tools to uh, produce produce uh, intracellular proteins of larger quantity. And for E. coli and the yeast. Um, because they're they can they can they're rapid growth and uh, low uh, op operational cost. Um, <clears throat> they they are usually used 
to 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 fast to produce uh, a, a lot of different types of recombinant proteins as well. Uh, but for yeast, uh, sorry, for insect, uh, for E. coli, uh, it does not have a post-translational modification mechanism, and when the uh, targeted protein is expressed too quickly in the E. coli cells, they can sometimes form inclusion bodies. So that will uh, impose some difficulties in terms of protein purification. So <clears throat> we have different host cells to choose, and based on the designated applications of, of the protein, it is important to choose the most suitable uh, host uh, for their, uh, for their uh, expression and preparation. So once the protein is made in the, in, in the designated host cell, the next step will be to extract these proteins from either culture media or cell lysate. So the chemical nature of the targeted protein actually dictates the purification strategy that we need to use. And certain features on the targeted protein are important and worthy of our attention <clears throat> in order to formulate the best purification strategy. And these features including if the protein bears any affinity tags and the molecular weight of the protein, the isoelectric point of the protein, as well as the overall or regional hydrophobicity distribution uh, of the target protein. So common types of column matrices include affinity, affinity matrices, um, iron exchange, gel filtration, which separates protein by the sizes, um, HIC, which stands for hydrophobic interaction column um, that separates protein by different hydrophobicity. Uh, we can also use absorption column or reverse phase column uh, for protein separation. But the over, overall, all these parameters need to be carefully studied in order to figure out which columns to use and in what order to use these columns in order to uh, obtain the best results for protein purification. So now let's take a step, uh, a step back and, and uh, to look at the process of target gene integration. So for E. coli and the yeast, as it's relatively easy, you can, we can either use chemical transformation, which is a method mainly used for E. coli gene integration, as well as electrocooperation, uh, which both of which inserts the target uh, vector plasmid into either E. coli cells or yeast cells. So for insect cells, the story is a little bit different. Uh, it would <clears throat> uh, require um, a intermediate called the bacrovirus to help integrate uh, the uh, gene of interest into the insect cells. So basically we take donor plasmid and integrate it with the helper plasmid, which is called bacmid. And then we create these uh, bacrovirus particles uh, in, the, uh, in, in insect cells. And then we use these viruses again to, in, to, infect, uh, to, to infect another insect cells in order to um, insert the target gene uh, into the cells for, uh, for uh, protein expression. And for mammalian cells, there are different, two, different strat uh, two different ways for protein expression, uh, either stable expression or transient expression. So for the stable expression, uh, we use methods, for instance, electrical cooperation uh, to, to integrate the target gene into the genome of the uh, mammalian cell <clears throat> culture. And through different uh, screening strategies, we identify cells that has uh, the optimal grow, growing, growing behavior, as well as uh, highest yield of the of the, uh, of, the of the protein in order to establish uh, cell, uh, to identify single colonies, and uh, subsequently we can establish uh, different uh, cell banks at uh, different scales uh, in order for uh, protein expression in this way. And secondly, uh, we can also use mammalian cells to perform this so-called transient protein expression or transient antibody expression. So what happens in this case uh, is that uh, we use uh, a, usually we use a positively charged polymer, which is called a transfection reagent, uh, to encapsulate the, uh, the, the expression vector and transfect them into the whole cells um, to, uh, and then the protein will be expressed uh, be expressed uh, for a shorter period of time in in, in the host cells um, for us to uh, for us to identify and purify. 
And it is very important to um, use the most compatible vectors, transfection reagent, as well as culture media to achieve the best transient, um, transient expression efficiency. Uh, so for instance, in this case, I've uh, shown that we have uh, optimized our uh, expression plasmid. So the protein, the, so the uh, transfection uh, efficiency when, and the protein expression level when use, uh, when you're using the, uh, the, the plasmid developed by in-house by Sino Biological is uh, a lot higher when compared to um, the, some of the uh, commercially available um, commercially available plasmid for the same purpose. And also uh, in this uh, in this case, I would like to demonstrate um, that the compatibility of culture media and the transfection reagent will also impact strongly on the uh, expression level, uh, on the protein expression level. And in this case, we used uh, the expression of 20 anti low expression antibodies as an example. Uh, so basically, we performed this optimization uh, by testing a combination of different culture media and transfection reagents. We had um, we have developed two different culture media recipes, M1 and M2, and the two different types of uh, <clears throat> transfection reagents called a T1 and T2. Uh, but we use a different combination of the, uh, the culture media and transfection reagent to test uh, which combination will result in the highest uh, antibody yield, but we we kept the uh, culture volume, the culture duration, and the temperature um, the same between these three different cultures. And as you can see, this uh, M2 and T2 combination uh, resulted in the uh, uh, elevation of antibody expression in this case. And we also correlated uh, this, the antibody expression level with this transfection um, efficiency based on the uh, strong uh, the, the GFP signal, where the M2T2 showed a, a better, <clears throat> stronger GFP signal, which indicates a higher uh, per, uh, transfection efficiency, which correlates very well with their uh, elevated antibody expression levels when compared to the other two conditions. So this um, case, um, the take home message, I think of this case is that um, the, the, the usage of a suitable combination of culture media as well as transfection reagent will help uh, greatly in terms of uh, increasing the yield of recombinant protein or recombinant antibody production. In the last section, I think we talked about uh, recombinant proteins, what they are, uh, and the key elements involved in recombinant protein expression and purification. Um, I think in this uh, uh, section, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some, of our, some of our strategies to, um, uh, to, for recombinant protein design and the strategies used to help their expression um, and purification in order to, and also troubleshooting in order to obtain um, high quality recombinant proteins. So once a target protein is identified, we usually use the, the workflow shown on this slide to design a recombinant protein expression project. So I would like to take this chance um, to walk you through this workflow and pick out the points that are worth, notice, worth noting. So first of all, the protein uh, comes to us uh, in the format of a uh, protein ID. And this ID is basically uh, the sequence of the protein, which can be obtained uh, from public sources such as Uniport or NCBI. And then it can also be supplied to us um, in, the, in the format of a, either a cDNA sequence or just the amino acid, the primary sequence the, uh, of the protein should be sufficient. So once the protein ID is identified or the, the protein sequence is obtained, we will perform a initial assessment uh, during, during which we will try to identify uh, some, measure some basic parameters of the protein, such as molecular weight, isoelectric point, and so on. And we will uh, try to identif identify 
<clears throat> the structural features on the protein. So for instance, if the protein has some uh, uh, trans uh, transmembrane domains, if so, how many, where, where they're located, and what kind of uh, post-translational, if, if the protein has some unique post-translational modifications. So for instance, uh, lipidations or some unusual glycosylation patterns or a GPI anchor uh, for that matter. And if the protein has some certain domains that we would like to be uh, like to pay attention to, so for instance, uh, some of these you know repetitive amino acid domains can sometimes uh, be problematic in terms of our recombinant protein expression. And then we will look at the cysteine con content of the protein. How many cysteines uh, are there in the sequence, and if the cysteines can form disulfide bond with each other? Uh, if so, uh, where are those disulfide bonds might located, which will give us an idea of the complexity uh, in terms of the protein structure, so, so help us to, saw, uh, to select a <clears throat> most suitable expression host. And we will also analyze the uh, instability as well as the disorderness of the protein uh, to, see how, you know, uh, to see how flexible the protein is. And if some of the regions on the protein are uh, responsible for the instability as well as disorderness of the protein, and to see if we would need to remove some of that or make some truncations in order to reduce the um, in, in, increase the stability of the protein to, to facilitate is, its expression. And we also uh, examined the hydrophobicity uh, distributions <clears throat> as well as uh, uh, since that, uh, as well as to uh, identify any references that, that we can uh, that we can refer to uh, uh, to see if the protein has is the protein or similar proteins has been uh, successfully expressed before, and if so, what kind of systems were used, uh, what kind of affinity tags were attached, what kind of purification methods were used. <clears throat> so basically, this is homework. So after the after the um, we've done a careful study of the target protein, we will propose uh, a, a so-called protein construct. Uh, and within this construct, we will dictate we will have the we will determine you know which part of the protein we need to express, either a domain or a whole construct, and what kind of host system to use. If we would need to uh, put some affinity tags to facilitate protein purification and what kind of a quality control methods and standards we would like to use um, once the protein has been made. And with the construct <clears throat> design complete, we will move to a pilot proof concept expression uh, to see if the construct works, if any adjustments are needed, uh, and <clears throat> perform troubleshooting if we encounter any um, issues, for instance, in the protein purification, uh, purification steps. And once all the uh, hurdles are jumped through, and then we can move on to a scale up in order to obtain a larger quantity of the uh, target protein. And during this process, we will also pay attention to um, to to to, mo to the formulation of the protein to ensure its stability, and also to monitor the activities of the protein during each uh, during each purification step in order to obtain the finally obtain a stable and highly active. Uh, recombinant protein for clients' purpose, for clients' applications, or um, for our internal use. Uh, but but the whole process is actually um, the whole process is dictated by the intended application uh, of the protein. So now I would like to um, share with you a few uh, in the format of a few case studies to see how these. Um, uh, design strategies or troubleshooting strategies are used in order to uh, for a recombinant protein expression and in order to obtain these high quality recombinant proteins or recombinant antibodies. So first of all, construct we talk let's talk about construct design. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the certain features of a protein would need to be removed in order to uh, facilitate its expression or certain domains of the protein can be combined together um, in order to um, uh, form the, uh, in order to seek for the best combination uh, that can either, uh, that can both satisfy, uh, satisfy the uh, expression and purification of the protein as well as, you know, functional studies. So in the case presented on the left side of the screen, 
Uh, so here we expressed a uh, extracellular domain of a membrane protein, and this protein was expressed in insect cells and purified as a and purified as a secreted protein. Um, <clears throat> during the uh, initial trial, once we made the first construct, we obtained uh, we observed that the protein hardly secreted. Um, in order to troubleshoot, we performed a uh, hydrophobic analysis of the N-terminal region of the protein, and, and we identified there is about 20 amino acids of a highly hydrophobic region at, at, at the N-terminus of the protein, which might um, uh, interfere with the, uh, with the stability of the protein and so that to uh, inhibit its secretion. So uh, after, ident after studying the function of the protein, we, uh, we, did, uh, we came to a conclusion that the removal of this small segment is not going to uh, in uh, interfere with the, with the biological activity of the target protein. So in construct two, uh, we uh, deleted this hydrophobic region and uh, it worked very well. The, the target protein has successfully secreted into the culture media and uh, we successfully obtained a secreted format of this extracellular, pro extracellular domain uh, of the target membrane protein. And for the case shown on the right side, so um, <clears throat> we uh, uh, tried to recombinantly express human uh, fatty acid synthase, uh, which is a multi-domain enzyme um, with a full length of over 2,000 amino acid long. So we express this protein in this insect cell as well and purify it uh, as an intracellular protein. Um, so we first express the full length of the protein, uh, which um, as you can see here, uh, the expression and purification was successful. And we did obtain a small quantity of, uh, of the target protein in its full length format. However, the yield was quite low and the purity of the protein was um, not at a desirable quant uh, quality, which is about 70%. <clears throat> so um, I think every system has a limit in terms of uh, what, kind, uh, uh, what size of a protein they can handle. So, but since it's a multi-domain enzyme in order to study the you know, different uh, functional dom domains of this enzyme, we don't necessarily need the whole protein. We can just pick out the, uh, the uh, domains of interest and focus on these, um, on these domain either individually or through a type of uh, combination. So here we made two attempts. Um, so, uh, we, so in the first construct, we, <clears throat> Uh, perform, uh, we combined two reductase domains, uh, but the, with the con it's uh, about 1,000 amino acid long, but the construct did not express very well. And in the second case, uh, in, in the second construct, uh, we combined a methyltransferase domain with uh, another uh, reductase domain. The overall size of the protein is 700 amino acids, still considered as a large protein, um, but this protein expressed very well intracellularly in the insect cells. We had a over 20 mg per liter yield, and the, the final protein product was uh, purified to a larger than 90% purity. So <clears throat> I think the take home message for this case is that uh, once, um, when the, uh, the, the obtaining the full length pro protein becomes challenging, and might consider we might consider um, uh, take take different domains of a protein and make a combination uh, to to <clears throat> to facilitate its uh, its expression and the study of these specific domains. Also, in the terms of construct designs, um, some virus proteins can be um, uh, they can have a, a complicated. Uh, oligomeric structures, uh, oligomeric formats. So for instance, we have, we expressed uh, several different formats of this uh, trimeric uh, parainfluenza F protein. Uh, F, F protein. Uh, the naturally occurring protein does form this trimeric structure, but the protein is um, difficult to express uh, and with a, with a lower yield. And uh, in collaboration with our um, uh, with one of our collaborators, uh, we, together we designed um, different uh, 
pro and we, we designed the different strategies in order to fortify this the, the structure of fortify the structure of this trimer and by uh, transfecting these proteins uh, via transient expression in HEC293 and uh, to extract the uh, the trimer after protein expression. Um, we did observe that uh, a combination of different mutation strategies would increase the uh, the content uh, uh, increase the trimeric uh, the trimeric format of the protein after purification and some of the strategies will result in uh, more than tenfold of increase uh, in the in in the protein trimer so i think the take home for this slide is that um, with proper um, construct design and with proper strategies imposed, uh, proper strategies used uh, to enhance the stability of the protein, uh, we can increase the yield substantially uh, for a originally unstable protein. The selection of a proper expression host is also important to uh, ensure the successful uh, pr production of a recombinant protein. So for instance, in this case, we try to produce the nuclear capsid protein of SARS-CoV-2, uh, which uh, is a 45 kilodalton protein in the format of a monomer, but the naturally occurring nuclear capsid proteins are inca uh, encapsulates uh, the, 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 gen the genetic material of the SARS-CoV-2 and is um, and present, often presented in the format of an oligomer. So we first used insect cells for its production, and after uh, after expression, we can we can obtain a mixture of ligomers as well as these uh, um, aggregates um, from the insect cell expressed um, <clears throat> protein preparations. And after some buffer optimization, we did uh, increase the ligomer content to about fifty percent, but we still uh, have some trouble in term, in, in the uh, aggregated proteins. And then we switched host from insect cells to E. coli. And the E. coli has you know, different strains with different genetic backgrounds. So it offers us a, a more versatile selection uh, of the expression host. So we first uh, expressed this protein in the, the, the first strain, which we, uh, from which we observed uh, soluble protein expression, but the proteins are prone to degrade, uh, prone to degradation, which did not uh, meet our, um, uh, uh, which did not meet our goal of production. And then we did a second. Uh, then we expressed the nuclear capsid in the second E. coli strain. Uh, as you can see, the protein was expressed mainly in the format of soluble protein, and after purification, the protein was. Um, Presented as a uh, <clears throat> as a stable oligomer, and even after three times of freezing song. So the <clears throat> so it's sometimes not necessarily a eukaryote host is 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 going to be uh, advent more advantageous uh, com uh, compared to E. coli, but um, the selection of the the most suitable uh, expression host based on the characteristics of the protein. Uh, is important in order to um, to ensure the success in the in the making of these proteins. And in order to facilitate the correct folding of a protein, there are also some tricks that we can use to help this process. Uh, which then um, here comes the idea of molecular chaperone, which are a type of, a type of molecules that uh, when Co um, when co-expressed with the target protein can facilitate the protein folding to, in to reach its correct format. So uh, on the uh, case shown on the left side of this page, uh, we use a quote-unquote universal chaperone, which are a combination of heat shock proteins and, uh, and the disulfide bound isomerase and so on. Um, so for the target protein, it's an enzyme that the active format is in the uh, homo in the, in the homodimer formation. And however, when the target protein was expressed alone, we can see only a small amount of dimer available. And uh, interestingly, this protein can reach a certain uh, a, a more advanced dimeric um, a, a more advanced dimer content uh, when incubated at room temperature for 48 hours. Uh, however, 
even after that, the, the dimer content was only reached to about 25%, and the activity of the enzyme, even though um, imp improved, is still not op uh, is still not optimal. Um, then we use uh, and we co-express the target protein in the presence of a uh, molecular chaperone, and as you can see, um, the pro <clears throat> after purification, the protein is in the dimer format without any in incubation time. And the and activity of this uh, protein also improved significantly. So these uh, universe these universal chaperones are useful um, once the a proper folding of a protein is is needed. Now in the case shown on the right side of the page, um, sometimes a universal chaperone uh, universal chaperones are uh, very helpful in order to. Um, <clears throat> facilitate protein folding and other processes. Uh, but sometimes a protein will require a specific a special companion in order to uh, to 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 reach is uh, to reach its active state. So for instance, in this case shown here, the active protein is um, need to be spliced by whole cell. Um, but in the this protein after splicing it's it, it contains two subunits which is connected uh, via an intermolecular disulfide bound. Um, um, so once, once this protein was expressed uh, by itself uh, in the HEC-293 system, we do observe some form of protein splicing, but there is still a <clears throat> large portion of the intact protein uh, within, within the preparation as indicated by the uh, reduction, uh, reduced SDS pages that uh, the results as well as the Western blots results. So then we uh, went back and uh, um, studied the uh, biological pathway that the protein um, is produced in the in the in the in the cell, and we identified that there is a uh, specific chaperone or specific molecule uh, <clears throat> that uh, that is in the uh, upstream of the protein expression uh, of the protein post translational modification pathway. That is very important to <clears throat> uh, that is very important to facilitate this protein splicing. So in the, so for the next preparation, uh, we co-express these two proteins together, and uh, they worked very well. Uh, we can see the diminish of the uh, intact protein band. The protein was spliced. All the protein were spliced, uh, <clears throat> and in terms of its pro in terms of protein activity. Um, the the partial is uh, there is uh, I think a more than four fourfold increase in its activity uh, when the protein is fully supplies uh, splice uh, versus its partially spliced counterpart. Lastly, I would like to uh, dedicate this slide to the purification strategy that are used to <clears throat> obtain um, the the recombinant protein in its uh, optimal format. So on the left side, we, sh uh, we showcased a uh, example where we expressed a single pass membrane protein in insect cells, and the protein was purified by a two-step purification, uh, a nickel affinity, affinity purification followed by a uh, gel filtration chromatography. Um, <clears throat> so the key element in this study was that the uh, extraction buffer recipe had need to be optimized. So we first extract the protein, use the PBS buffer with the with the detergent number one, let's say, and we can observe that uh, no protein was eluded from the from the nickel column, which indicates the protein extraction was not successful. And then we uh, then we uh, kept the the main recipe of the buffer, which is PBS, and we'd replace the detergent um, one with another detergent, um, and this worked, and we successfully extracted the protein uh, using the second detergent. And uh, in the uh, uh, and, and in the gel filtration uh, purification, we replaced the second detergent with the third uh, with the third detergent in order to uh, increase its stability and uh, Eventually, we uh, after these uh, the two-step purification, we successfully obtained this um, membrane, this stable membrane protein uh, in the in the 
detergent uh, in a buffer containing detergent number three. And also for protein purification, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, a systematic process that would need to be optimized based on the characteristic of the protein. Uh, so here we presented one example of this systematic optimization. So this is a uh, SCFV knob and hole based uh, by specific antibody, which was expressed in HEC-293. Um, so first we used a, a protein A chromatography to, uh, uh, to uh, interact with the FC domain of the protein in order to uh, the, the, the antibody and for its expression. So afterwards, we identified uh, <clears throat> the protein contains a monomer, uh, a, a, a contains the monomer of the antibody as well as some aggregations. And, and in the meantime, there are also present some mismatched chains. Uh, in, uh, so the two, two, uh, two, two knob chains and two whole chains uh, is also present in this mixture. Then we analyzed the uh, electrodes uh, the electrostatic characteristics of these three uh, of these three different formats of antibody, and we uh, we identified there are differences in the uh, electro isoelectro point isoelectro points of these uh, three different formats of the of the antibody. So the so for the next step, we used ion exchange uh, chromatography, um, which successfully separated uh, the three different uh, <clears throat> Formats of the of the uh, of the antibody, and we successfully uh, collected the fraction that contains um, the correct format, which is the the knob chain uh, in the in, in paired with the uh, with the whole chain. So once this uh, fraction is collected, um, we ident we also identified some aggregates presented in this in this preparation. And then we last, lastly, we used the gel filtration uh, step to, re to remove the aggregates based on their molecular weight. And finally, we were successfully obtained a, <clears throat> a monomeric format of this antibody um, with, a very, with a very high purity, both in terms, uh, both in terms, of, the, uh, in terms of page analysis, as well as analyze, analyzed by uh, SCCHPLC. So um, to uh, give a quick summary, uh, so recombinant proteins are, they're mainly produced in cultures and they're widely used as uh, reagents for life science and as also as therapeutics. And these, <clears throat> a recombinant protein expression project can usually be divided into several stages. Uh, the key elements includes the uh, the expression vector, host cells, as well as the uh, purification uh, the schemes. And the, both the prokaryotes or the eukaryotes systems are available and they're able to produce um, different proteins of different shapes and formats. But the important thing is to select a uh, most suitable uh, expression host uh, for, for each project. And certain protein <clears throat> and certain uh, sequence features in a protein may cause problems in its uh, production. And uh, so they should be carefully analyzed. And if these sequences are not uh, associated with the uh, <clears throat> uh, final application of the protein, they can be removed or truncated uh, in order to facilitate protein expression. And last but not least, of course, uh, multiple chromatography methods uh, can be used to um, obtain a high purity protein. and uh, Purification scheme uh, should be designed based on the biochemical characteristics uh, of the protein. So uh, I think that's all that I would like to talk about today. Um, thank you for your time, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Chan, for that wonderful presentation. At this point, we are going to move into the question and answer session of our webinar. Again, for those of you who may have joined us late, you can send in your questions or comments by typing them into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and as a reminder, we may not have time to get to all of your questions, but they will be collected and sent to the Sinobiological team after this. So, Dr. Chen, thanks again. Let's go into the first question here. This one says, which proteins are considered as challenging to produce via recombinant expression? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is an interesting question because uh, even though recombinant protein 
expression technique is a powerful tool to produce uh, target proteins of like essentially all shapes and forms, but there are some proteins that are considered as challenging to produce uh, using this technique. And we have encountered uh, several of them during our uh, 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 either product development stage or CR service projects. So for instance, I would say proteins with transmembrane domains are essentially hard to express because they usually express at a lower level. And to extract these proteins, it is challenging because they have a transmembrane domain which is associated with cell membrane. So we have to disrupt this type of interaction uh, using uh, essentially various uh, methods. Uh, there are detergent methods or uh, nano disks to facilitate protein assembly and et cetera. So the membrane proteins are considered as one of the crown jewels, if you will, in terms of a recombinant protein expression. And also, uh, for instance, another type of protein that are considered hard to produce are the ones that are essentially toxic to the host cells. So with the, their overexpression, the host cells die easily so that we won't be able to accumulate enough uh, biomass for protein purification. And another type of protein that I think are uh, challenging to produce are those ones with a uh, high, uh, a large region of disordered uh, domains or motifs. If, uh, uh, by any standards, uh, by any standards, but because uh, these proteins are tend to uh, uh, be behave rather radically, I would say, uh, because of these disordered regions, they can fold. Uh, they can uh, have a more random folding pattern. So, which means we will are more easily get proteins that are with the incorrect conformation that are easily degra degraded by the host cells. So, which significantly impacts its yield. So, yeah, so there are certain proteins that will be hard to produce, uh, but there are, interestingly, there are ways to produce these challenging proteins as well. Uh, but I, I think uh, due, due to the time that that might be like a, a, another story for another time, maybe. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Let's move on to our next question. This one says, are there any other host systems for recombinant protein expression addition to the ones mentioned in the talk? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, the ones that I mentioned in the talk, uh, namely HEC293, CHOs, the insect cells, uh, E. coli, and yeast, they're considered as the most commonly used uh, host systems for recombinant protein expression. And these are also the systems that we use uh, on a daily basis uh, at Sinobiological. But you know, by no, by no means these four or these uh, yeah these four are the uh, you know only available host systems. So for instance, uh, I think for in, in terms of a, a, a mammalian cell cultures, uh, some people or some labs use spe specialized mammalian cells to, to produce uh, recombinant proteins. For instance, mouse myeloma and S0 cell lines are, are commonly used to produce some proteins. And for bacteria, I think uh, people are using more and more of this like a bacillus uh, bacteria uh, to utilize their unique uh, biochemical background for recombinant protein expression. And also, interestingly, we can also use plants to make recombinant protein as well. Um, from my past experience, uh, speaking from my own experience, actually, uh, I used the plants, especially tobaccos, to produce recombinant proteins. We can either use the, the leaves or the whole plant by just inject uh, uh, agrobacteria that are infect, uh, infected with the uh, target protein for uh, for its expression, or we can also convert these uh, tobacco cultures into you know, essentially into cell cultures as well, and use these cell cultures to uh, to produce uh, recombinant proteins. So I think there are uh, many different tools uh, to fulfill this task. And I think one last bit of this quote unquote host system is uh, to that, that we can uh, discuss is that um, I think nowadays there are uh, these so-called cell-free protein express, expression systems. Uh, basically you take the cell lysate from a host cell and uh, 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 put in uh, put in uh, uh, the, re the required uh, reagents as well as the plasmid encoding the target protein. And this cell-free system can 
generate proteins in a matter of hours instead of a uh, uh, instead of days, uh, comparing to the uh, whole, uh, the the cell cell based systems. And these cell-free system can be, uh, you know, quote unquote, assembled because you can you can take the essential components of the uh, cellular protein generation pathway and put them together, and then you can have a you can have a cell-free system to work with. Uh, but one, uh, I wouldn't say caveat, but you know, one issue regarding these cell-free system is that um, they they produce proteins because they're producing proteins relatively fast, um, so the the yield of these systems are relatively low compared to uh, the cell-based systems. Um, so that's one, uh, cons that's one concern to bear in mind. Um, uh, if you would like to pursue the protein expression using a cell-free system. And uh, interestingly, these cell-free systems are very uh, powerful in terms of producing these toxic proteins. So that might be also you know, something to bear in mind if, um, when, when you come to the uh, crossroad to select a uh, you know, suitable system for uh, the expression of your target protein. Okay, great, thank you. Let's go on to our next question. This one says, is there a, pro a protein secretion pathway in bacteria cells that one can use to generate secreted form of target proteins? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, yeah, I think if we can generate proteins as a secreted form, it will uh, greatly facilitate protein purification. Uh, however, I think uh, there is not a, a, a you know conventional secretion pathway, uh, and for that matter, in in the bacteria system, when you compare it with the uh, you know secrete uh, sec protein secretion pathway in either HEC two ninety three or insect cells. But you know, bacteria, especially E. coli, um, you know, between their plasma membrane and their cell wall uh, and their yeah, cell walls, uh, there is a, uh, a, a a little space called a per uh, periplasmic space, um, and uh, this region can be used to uh, enrich target proteins so that they can be uh, uh, you know they can be avoid of the uh, uh, complex biochemical. Uh, environment uh, within the cells. So the bacteria cells, especially for for instance, E. coli, they do have a um, you know transporting system that transports protein from the uh, uh, cytoplasm to the uh, periplasmic membrane, uh, periplasmic space. I'm sorry. Um, there is a uh, also a, like a, a translocation signal or quote unquote signal peptide. Uh, for that matter, you can install it on the on the target protein, and and uh, that the bacteria cells will transport it to the periplasmic uh, space. But one thing to keep in mind is that uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, this the periplasmic space between uh, the uh, between the walls and the and and the cell uh, and the cell mem uh, and the plasmic membrane uh, is very limited. So you can only export a certain amount of proteins. To this space, and in order to harvest this this, um, this protein, we can certainly use um, conventional protein, uh, sorry, bacteria uh, breakage methods, for instance, like homogenization. Uh, but there are other uh, <clears throat> methods that can use uh, so that we can so re relative uh, uh, do it in a more selective way to you know pop the cell walls, collect the proteins from uh, this periplasmic space. But one concern I would say for using this strategy is that the biochemical environment in the periplasmic space might be friend more friendly for some proteins uh, but the yield will be relatively low uh, because due to the you know size limitation of this of this uh, periplasmic space so that's one thing to uh, consider if you would like to uh, you know uh, take this approach great thank you Here's another question that says, what are the major differences in proteins produced by HEC-293 and show cells? Okay, um, I think HEC-293, as a you know, mammalian cell cultures, HEC-293 and show cells, are, show cells are both very powerful tools to produce either proteins, a recombinant proteins, or recombinant antibody for that matter. Uh, both cells can uh, have, uh, you know, more sophisticated folding and post-translational modification mechanism uh, that can ensure the proper folding and the addition of 
uh, these post-translational modifications to the protein and the antibody. Um, however, one major difference, I would say, um, the, uh, for proteins expressed by you know these two cell lines are the uh, glycosylation patterns, uh, especially I think that the terminal sialic acid, the linkage and the amount of the sialic acid uh, when added onto the uh, uh, onto the N glycan chain, uh, because uh, these two cells are HEC two either HEC, uh, because HEC two ninety three and CHOs they're derived from different species. Uh, HEC two ninety three is actually a human um, human originated cell lines so called. HEC because it's, it stands for human, I think human embryo kidney cell line 293 and CHO is derived from Chinese hamster ovarian. So because of their, you know, the, the difference in their origin of species, um, <clears throat> they do have different uh, glyc glycotransferase, uh, pro uh, glycotransferase profiles within these cells. So one major difference, the, the, as a result, one major difference will be the, uh, the structure of the glycan chain. Um, but I think there are also other uh, subtle differences, I would say, that are also can be imposed by, the, uh, by these cell lines. Um, but one, uh, but the, the 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 major difference that are people cared about the most are the uh, are are the uh, you know the structure of the uh, the end glycan, uh, glycan chains. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions here. This one says, "What is the molecular weight limit for each host system?" Huh, that's an interesting question because uh, <clears throat> uh, we. Do encounter proteins are you know huge relatively uh, in in size, um, but I, I wouldn't just you know put a solid number onto onto this onto this and into this question uh, because I think the each host systems are have its uniqueness and can process proteins uh, that are different in, sh in shapes and formats, but. Uh, I think as a rule of thumb, so if we're, you, but you know, you can't just, you know, put a, uh, if you put a, you know, protein with a quote unquote unlimited size, if you will, uh, it will certainly um, <clears throat> impose uh, a significant amount of stress to each host cells. Uh, so for us, I think our experience is that for um, a bacteria, so if we want to, you know, work on the safe side um, and uh, to, um, to, uh, to consider uh, the molecular weight of the protein as one of the uh, uh, limiting issues for, in terms of its expression. We do observe that if your protein is, has a larger molecular weight, the yield could be um, uh, lowered because uh, you know, it could be easy, more easily uh, misfolded and then, and, 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 then and then degraded. So uh, let's say for a bacteria expression system, uh, we would consider a protein with molecular weight uh, under maybe uh, 600, uh, 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 maybe uh, let's say 80 kilodaltons will be uh, will be more safe to be expressed using this uh, host system. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, I think for the eukaryotic systems, they're more tolerant in terms of uh, protein. Uh, molecular weight. So for the, the mammalian cell systems, um, they can produce large proteins, um, for instance, like antibodies, which are 150 kilodaltons in uh, in molecular weight. So uh, you know, uh, some something around that will be uh, we normally consider something around that as this uh, uh, molecular weight limit. Uh, insect cells are actually more versatile in this matter. Uh, we do produce proteins with over 2,000 or even 3,000 amino acids in length. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, put a molecular weight limit onto the insect cells. And because insect cells are often used to produce these like mega structures with uh, multiple subunits. So yeah, these cells are really powerful in terms of a uh, molecular, uh, in terms of a protein uh, expression. Okay, hey, great, thank you. We have time for one more question, and this one says, how do you choose a suitable buffer for recombinant proteins? Okay, um, so I think this is more technical technical question. So in terms of a uh, buffer, um, uh, so we do uh, this sort of a, like a buffer selection after protein expression. So 
uh, I think the a quote unquote suitable buffer is to is a buffer where this uh, the target protein or proteins uh, can be can live in there happily and uh, that reflects its uh, in terms of its stability. So if um, well, we uh, the standard that we use to choose a buffer uh, for recombinant proteins is usually that once the protein is um, stored in this buffer, we would test its uh, uh, stability in terms of uh, if it can survive uh, multiple rounds of freeze and song. And also, uh, <clears throat> if the uh, we will observe if the protein will form aggregates uh, you know, when stored at uh, either four degrees or room temperatures for a certain period of time. Um, so, uh, so if uh, if a protein is you know happy in a buffer, it, sh it should be relatively stable for a certain period of time. Uh, well, you know you can't store a protein in a buffer forever, but. Uh, I think in terms of a shelf shelf life uh, for some proteins, maybe uh, if the protein can be stable for a couple of months or even more ideally a couple of years, uh, and I think that would be considered as a uh, you know a suitable buffer uh, for the restoration of the protein, uh, for the storation of the protein, and also another. Uh, uh, another thing I think we would need to consider uh, to choose a buffer because you know the buffer can also come in different shapes and formats. We can have a different uh, salts to you know buffer the pH of the buffer. Um, <clears throat> we can also use some additives in terms of uh, to uh, to uh, enhance the stability of a protein. However, uh, one thing that to keep in mind is that the selection of a buffer, uh, be it the uh, you know the the basic format, if it's a tris or PBS or heaps and MES and so on, or the additives that you would like to add to the protein. So for instance, glycerol or uh, some like reducing agents such as TSAP uh, and so on. Um, you have to, we have to uh, make sure that whatever we choose is not going to interfere with the subsequent application of such protein. So for instance, if we would like to uh, label this protein using a amine chemistry base, then the TRIS buffer is not going to be suitable for this application. Um, and uh, also if you would like to uh, uh, mount a protein onto a chip later, uh, then the content of the glycerol, uh, we, we might uh, consider, uh, we might carefully adjust the content of the glycerol if the glycerol is required to stabilize a protein so that the, the you know, the glycerol content is not going to, uh, in, you know, interfere uh, with the, with, with the uh, immobilization of the protein on the chips. So uh, I think to sum up, uh, you want to choose a buffer that the protein can um, uh, can be stable for an extended period of time, but it, again, uh, but in the meantime, the I think the chemical composition of the buffer uh, should not interfere with the uh, subsequent applications of the target proteins. All right, wonderful. Thanks so much. This brings us to the end of this webinar. Just a reminder that this webinar will be available on demand shortly following this presentation. On behalf of LabX, I'd like to thank Dr. Yuning Chen for all the hard work he put into his presentation. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I'd also like to thank our webinar sponsor, Sinobiological, for their support. Their support allows LabX to offer these webinars free of charge to our readers. For more information on all of our upcoming or on-demand webinars, or to learn more about the sale and purchasing process for scientific process, electronic testing, and medical equipment, please visit our website at labx.com. We hope you can join us again. Thank you and have a great day.